Right, okay. So welcome all to our webinar today on a path to enhance health and productivity. Uh, as some of you already know, I'm Dr. Dalvinder Kaur, Senior Lecturer and Program Coordinator of the School of Education at Manipal Globe Next University, and I'll be moderating today's session. Now, let me begin with some house rules for this webinar. First, unless you're speaking, please keep your microphone muted because I can hear some background noise. So please keep your microphones muted to minimize background noise and distraction for others. Thank you. And second, you are encouraged to actively participate by asking questions verbally or via the chat box only during the Q&A session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in a fast-paced world defined by constant demands and evolving well-being and peak for performance has never been more crucial. So today we have with us two esteemed speakers who will share their valuable insights and some practical steps in finding balance between health and productivity, which I believe is essential, especially for all of our research scholars in MGNU and even for me, as we are all seeking to thrive in both our personal and professional spheres. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our first speaker today, Namita Piparaya, who will be speaking on crafting healthy lifestyles. Welcome, Namita. Thank you. Before finding her true calling in yoga and wellness, Namita was an MBA and senior corporate executive with MNCs such as Citibank, Aviva, and Future Generally. She understands the challenges of fast-paced modern lives and the nature of workplace stresses having been in this industry. Her personal experience enables her to identify the correct wellness practices that helps organizations and individuals live their best lives with better health, productivity, and quality of life. Yoga Nama is a product of Namita's life journey, an academic bent of mind, a voracious drive for learning, and the ability to integrate multiple disciplines. That enables her to deliver exceptional and unique experiences, relatable content, and practical solutions for overall well being. Her particular interest is stress management. Now, through Yoga Nama, Namita's mission is to empower people with wellness foundations so that they can understand how to take charge of their health and thereby improve their quality of life and live up to their highest potential. So, Namita, one of the most important questions, which I believe is a is on everyone's mind too, is what made you shift from banking to wellness? Over to you, Namita. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dalvinder, for that introduction. And yes, that's a question I do get very often. And there are two reasons why I made that shift. One was my own health and second were my interests. So the corporate life was kind of challenging for my health. And from the first job onwards, I started seeing the impact, developing hormonal issues, not knowing how to manage stress. So there was a lot of lack of awareness at that point in time, how to manage that. And second, I was always interested in health and wellness while I was in financial services. That wasn't something I was inherently enthusiastic about. So making this shift was about following a journey that was aligned to my passions and playing to my strengths. Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Dalvinder. Yeah. Sorry, am I audible now? Yes. So, Namita, thank you for sharing. But if you had to do over, would you take the same decision again, given all your learnings and experience on this journey? There are, there are two things to it. One, from my health and wellness perspective, yes, definitely, because I'm now much better equipped to handle the challenges that a typical corporate life brings, which I did not know back then. So as I like to say, I had to quit the corporate life, but you don't have to, because there are ways, very simple ways in which we can have optimal health while keeping our jobs and our productivity levels high. And second, in terms of my interest, I would make one change, which is spend more time in finding the jobs that are aligned to my strengths and things that I inherently love to do because that takes a lot of stress and the uh, uh, expense of being in the corporate life out of it when you're very very passionate about what you are doing so that's what i would change so you're trying to say is that even being in a corporate job you can still maintain uh, balance between wellness and productivity right absolutely yes 
would you mind, uh, would you be able to share, since your interest revolves around stress management as well, would you be able to share some key messages with our participants today? Absolutely. On how to maintain this balance? Yes, and I do have a presentation here, if you're okay, I will put this up that has a very succinct yes. update on my four to five key messages for the group, and I'm sure that will be valuable for the team. So just give me a second as I put up my screen. All right, here we go. So this is the presentation. I'll try to keep it very short and simple because these are just the top level messages I want to bring to everyone's awareness so they know what is to be done in terms of your health and wellness. And I would love to be for it to be more conversational. Please feel free to ask me questions. That is what, what will make it relevant for you. Otherwise, I will say what I have to, but I would love to hear what your questions are. So very simple. How do we go around to create healthy lifestyles? I've already been introduced, but a little bit about me is here from banking to wellness. Uh, you can find me on social media as well. My company is called Yoganama Wellness. There are five things here. In terms of your health and well-being, there is physical activity, there is diet, very important sleep, and mindfulness, which you will cover in the next session. So I will spend very little time on it, but that's one of the best ways to manage stress and improve quality of life. And a little bit of just touching upon these things. So they are in your mind that social and spiritual health also matters. It's a holistic perspective. Everything comes together. So let's look at physical activity, right? What to do? There are so many options today. One of the most common questions I get is what can I do? What is the best exercise? Is it yoga? Is it gym? Is it running? And to be honest, the best activity is the one that you can do that is sustainable for you, that you enjoy, because otherwise it is going to be very, very difficult to keep showing up every day to do something which is going to be an integral part of your routine. And the best part is... Maybe you do low load diet check and done after battery charger replacement. I think someone needs to be on mute or is that a question? All right, I'll continue. So the, the good thing is what is called the beginner's advantage. If you are currently sedentary, doesn't matter which activity you take up, you will see tremendous results. Even with walking, people see cardiovascular improvement and even strength building. So if you are wondering where to start, start anywhere and start with whatever you can because five minutes of activity is better than zero minutes. So you're just adding, it's only going up from there. So now, but there are some guidelines as to what's the bare minimum, which is ideal. So the bare minimum is there are three broad categories. You need cardiovascular health for your heart and your respiratory system. You need strength because we lose muscle mass with age, which is called sarcopenia. And that's one of the biggest reasons for metabolic health decline in our middle age. And next is flexibility, mobility. In terms of cardio, it is just 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity per day, or sorry, per week is enough. If you don't have time, then make it more challenging, 75 minutes of vigorous activity. And a good way to understand what's moderate intensity is that you can talk, but you cannot sing. And a vigorous activities, you cannot talk either because it's challenging, so you need lesser time for it. So it's not a lot. 30 minutes a day of brisk walking can also cut it, just five to six days a week. In terms of strength, again, you do not have to spend hours and hours in the gym. Current recommendations, both from the heart and our longevity perspective, is just 60 minutes of strength training, which could be just two 30-minute sessions a week, can do the job for you, which should include your, your most of your top muscles, the, the key muscles, and then could just be one set or two sets each exercise. What I want to bring home here is you do not need to become an athlete. You do not need to put in hours and hours. A little bit of activity goes a long way. What we want to avoid is sedentary living. And these are health agencies recommended and evidence-based results that just twice a week of strength training, which you can do at home with resistance bands will also suffice. Additional bonus is flexibility and mobility, which as much time as you can give. If you've done cardio or strength, give 10 minutes in the end to cool down, stretch, which anyways feels very nice and will help you transition into your day much better. Probably not relevant for this group is the line at the bottom, which is balanced training. Very important for likely our parents and senior citizens because that is very important to prevent the risk of fall. That fall is often where the decline begins in old age. So balance training becomes more important after a certain age. So that's it. 
30 minutes of cardio or maybe 15, 20 minutes uh, uh, a day if you don't have time. Twice a week, figure out a way to get some 20, 30 minutes of at-home strength training. Body weight itself can help. <laughs> Next one. So uh, I'm I'm going to skip the research studies because we don't have much time, but there's some very fun concepts we learn from these papers. Maybe if we have time in the end, I will cover that. Moving on to wholesome diet. Now, what to eat? Internet and social media and everyone, even PhDs and researchers can confuse us to know when what is the right diet to eat. And I have some specifics for you just to make it simple. First, three basic things. Your diet has to be sustainable while for the environment, but also for you, which means affordable, which means has to be easy, which means doesn't take hours of time and 200 ingredients and is not too restrictive. The biggest mistake we can make is try to restrict our diet too much and go on to 1200 or very restricted diets because they're not sustainable. No research has found that people who cut down their diet significantly sustainably lost weight. They lose weight, almost 75% of them gain it back within a year or two years. So restriction is not the answer. Second, enjoyable. There is a misconception that if something is healthy, it will taste bad. That's not true. Healthy foods can taste good. You can add your little butters. You can add your little cheeses, et cetera, to make something uh, nourishing and enjoyable for all your senses. You don't have to deprive yourself completely. Third important factor to know is balanced. Balance comes through variety. The more variety we eat, the better our gut bacteria. Moderation, we all know, is important. And some degree of self-regulation is needed because our food environment today is highly obesogenic. We are living in an environment where food is in abundance and often not good quality. We have choice, so there's a bit of self-regulation that has to come into play. So now... I'm going to talk about India specific. What is it that is going wrong with our diet at a top level that you can fix without getting into this diet is better or that diet is better. So the latest surveys, both diabetes surveys and our dietary surveys run by the organization ICMR tell us four key facts that we as Indians are eating too many refined carbohydrates. In some states, even 70, 80, 85% of total calories are coming from rice and wheat, which is not balanced. So we need to reduce the carbohydrate content and make sure 80% of our carbs are full. You do not have to go on low carb. You don't have to stop carbs. All they're saying is too much is happening. Let's bring it back a little. 80% of your meals are all refined carbs and there is a challenge. Most of this is just white rice. Second issue is there's a lot of processed food, high calorie, low nutrition. To give an example, in urban cities in India, the rich elite is consuming around 3000 calories. 900 of those are coming from junk and processed food and they are highly inactive. So you can see the imbalance. You do not have to stop eating your chocolate and biscuits, but look at that number of 900 calories. We have to bring it down, eat in moderation. Our biggest problem actually is too much salt. Hypertension or high blood pressure is our most common disease in India right now because we consume a whole lot of salt by way of chips, achar, namkeen, farsan, everything. So something to keep in our awareness, how to reduce it, not make it zero, how to reduce it. And I think the last factor that comes in uh, is a lot of misinformation and myths, which kind of prevent this very simple behavior change. Pick up any national survey, this is what will stand out at you. But the information we are getting in social media or media is not coming through as clearly as it should. So what should our diet be like? I'm going to take the example of diabetes because as Indians and our genetics and our lifestyle puts us at a very high risk of metabolic issues at a very young age. So what is the best way as with Indian genetics, can we prevent diabetes or metabolic issues or cardiovascular issues? Then this is what the 2022 survey came up with. This diet is suggested to prevent prediabetes and diabetes, but it's pretty good for Indians in general which was reduce your carbohydrate to 55% of calories, not 80, 55. Protein, we get very little, 7, 10% in the poorer states. And even in metros, because we are largely vegetarian, we don't eat enough protein. At least 20% of total calories, bring it up to there. Fat, 25%, choose healthier fats. Another problem is uh, fiber. Typical recommendation is we should get five servings of fruits and vegetables in a day. Serving That's is around fair. 80 
Pushan, could you mute them? Thank you. Right. So, and then fiber is also important because while we are a vegetarian nation, we still eat more carbohydrate than fruits and vegetables. So all this is telling you is increase your fruit vegetables. Don't be afraid of fruits and blood sugar spikes or whatever you keep listening to. Eat variety of fruits, not just the super sweet ones. Eat your apple pear also, not just the mangoes. And try to find ways to add more protein into your diet. Add protein to every meal. That is one of the simplest hacks. Try to eat everything with some protein in it and you will get there. Eat more fruits and vegetables. So I've given some examples there. 25 to 40 grams fiber. This is individual tolerance, right? Because everybody doesn't do well with fiber, but 20, 25 is the minimum. And idli would be 80% carbs. Your whole wheat chapati would be 60%. Uh, an apple or a, you know, or one teaspoon of piece of gold or psyllium husk would be four or five grams of fiber. So it gives you a broad idea. You don't have to go around tracking everything. You, you just need to see what you eat in a day and make just intuitive tweets. Protein in every meal. Let's have an extra apple. Let's, uh, uh, let's reduce the, the carbohydrate here. Can I substitute it with, let's say, you know, all the chilas and uh, moong dal uh, dosas, etc. that you make. So these are, that's, that's all that's needed for diet. Little less carb, little less salt, and little more protein and fiber. Everything else is going to take care of itself for 90% of the people with these minor tweaks in diet. And um, yeah, I have time. So again, I'm going to uh, I'm going to skip the research. If we have time, I'll come back to it. Sleep, uh, we I don't know how many people understand that sleep is really important, especially in corporate life. There is one message I'll give you. Sleep is more important than work. And we underestimate. If you can do nothing else for your health and wellness, just make sure you get good sleep. Uh, again, simple things help. Uh, first, before I get into it, let me just refresh why is sleep important, because it is when you're sleeping that a lot of the growth and recovery and repair in the body happens. It's important for your physical and mental health. Less sleep, less than seven hours of sleep is linked to every metabolic issue from obesity to diabetes to poor lipid profile to even hypertension. So if you want to lose weight and if, it, if this is what motivates most people, I, I don't like using this example, but let's assume if weight loss is everyone's motivation, then sleep is an integral part of it. Won't happen without that. Mental health, your memory, memory consolidation, all experiences and learnings you've had during the day will get consolidated and filed away in your brain at the time of sleep. Good for your heart health as well. Your immune system will not work optimally if sleep is not there. Around seven to eight hours is generally good. Too little and too much, both are bad. Moderation is required. So I hope it gives you an idea. Sleep is necessary. So don't ignore it. And uh, there are some things called sleep hygiene practices around 12 to 15 practices, all of them evidence-based, some of them linked to our traditional wisdom as well. I'm going to cover four or five of these. You can read or take a screenshot. First is sunlight. Very, very important because that is how your body tells time. If we do not expose ourselves to light, we, we body doesn't know how to tell time. So morning sunlight is very good to get sleep later on at night. Having the same routine is another way that body tells time. These are called zeit givers or time givers. If you exercise at the same time, if you eat at the same time, if you go to bed at the same time, all of these are ways for your body to tell time. While going to sleep at night, these things are helpful. A room at 21 degrees of temperature, centigrade. A dark room, so have blackout curtains if you need. And sometimes a high carb meal helps people sleep better and a high protein meal makes you more alert. So that is something if sleep is really troubling. So a little bit of a high carb meal, if you're not diabetic, you can explore. And there are, of course, uh, stress management interventions like yoga nidra, body scan, brahmari pranayam, which I'll try to cover one or two if we have time. So just some relaxation. So you are not alert, you're not worrying, you're not focused on work. You're able to make the switch from work to rest at bedtime. And of course, no caffeine, no exercise, or no naps just before bedtime. Simple things or what you can do for sleep. Most important is number one, morning sunlight. Now we come to mindfulness. I would call it stress management. Mindfulness, it's interchangeable because that's where it becomes most effective. And uh, I'm sure you will cover it, but quickly, what is mindfulness, right? And one definition, there are many, but one of the two that I really like is, it's your ability to choose what you pay attention to. You have a resource, which is called attention. You can strengthen it. Let's say you go to the gym and you're like, I want to be able to lift 100 kilos of weight. 
you will not start with 100 kilos. You will start with 5, 10 or whatever your current capacity is. Let's say you want to do the same thing with the mindfulness. You go to the gym of mindfulness. You're like, I want to be able to use my attention continuously for 20 minutes. You will probably have to start with one minute. So just to be able to focus for one minute is a good enough target for mindfulness. The Why I'm sharing this with you is that number one problem that people tell me is I can't concentrate, I can't sit still, I can't pay attention. But that is why we use mindfulness. It's a way to train, to lift one minute, one minute, so that it eventually becomes 20 minutes, eventually 60 minutes of continuous attention, which is fairly advanced, but let's say start with a minute. So, uh, and there are various ways. The yogic way is uh, pranayama and meditation. And the Buddhist way is more awareness focused on present moment and feelings and sensations. So this is this this skill is really, really important for multiple factors from your cognitive skills, your ability to handle stress, your resilience to stress, which is that people who practice mindfulness will not get thrown back by difficult life events as easily as if you were not practicing mindfulness. So it's a way of strengthening, but instead of the body, we're strengthening or lifting weights with our mind. And now in terms of mindfulness, right, I'm going to share two breathing practices that you all can look at, which are very, very relevant for the workplace. One is called prolonged exhalation or dirgha pranayam. And second one is called box breathing. Now, very interesting fact is that this, both these uh, breathing practices were researched by Navy SEALs and Army and police forces across US and other countries. And they found that when you're just about to, let's say, engage a weapon, when you're just about to fire or shoot, which of these two breathing practices is better? And they found prolonged exhalation. So the theory is that when you have to engage with a stressor, which means you have to go for an interview in a corporate environment, or you have to go give a very difficult board presentation, you have to engage, act, then prolonging your exhalation, making your exhalation longer is more effective. So all you have to do in this is you take a normal breath and you exhale, lengthen, draw, try to make your exhalation longer than your inhalation. Maybe we can give it a quick try. So everyone just sit upright a little comfortably. Take a normal breath in, not a deep normal breath in and exhale it out slowly. Control it. For the next one, you can try closing your eyes. Let's do two more. Inhale normally and exhale it slowly. One more time, inhale normally, and exhale it out slowly. That's it, just three breaths. Not a lot, but I'm sure even three breaths would give you a little different experience in the head space, in the mind space, which which you can which you can think about. So if you do just five to ten of these breaths in a calm state, they can help you prepare better for a presentation or an interview. I use it very actively because when I was in the corporate world, another challenge I had is huge stage fright. And if I had known this breathing technique, I would have had much better presentations before. But this is something that really, really helps with that. Second one is called box breathing or square breathing, which involves breath retention. Now, this kind of breathing practice is more effective when you have to internalize a difficult situation and not act like in the previous one. Like your boss is angry shouting at you or your partner is going through a tough phase or you just you just cannot act. You have to sit there and digest and process that. And it can be very, very stressful to do that. And that is when box breathing is more helpful. And we will try it. But let me tell you how to do it. We'll do a simple four count breath. So you kind of make a square with your breath. You inhale for the same count. You hold the breath. Then you exhale. And then you hold the breath out again. So inhale, hold. Exhale, hold. So let's try just two rounds of this for a count of four. It'll go like this. I'll say inhale, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four. Much slower. So everyone breathe out. Let's empty the breath out. Let's create space. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four. Exhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four. Maybe close your eyes. Inhale, one, two, three, four. 
hold one, two, three, four. Exhale one, two, three, four. Hold one, two, three, four. That's it. Five to 10 of these breaths or doing this for even five minutes itself has been found really effective. So uh, this is why I wanted to leave you with at least two practical tips that these are the breathing practices available to you to get through everyday life situations. And there's a lot more to this, but this, this, is, this is enough in your toolkit for now. And uh, first one, engage with the stressor. Second one, cannot engage. You have to just take whatever is life bringing at you. So that was in the mindfulness space. I have just covered the breath work. I will skip the research. All right. Now, last one is social and spiritual health, something we often ignore. And I call this your connection with yourself and with others. Both are important for your health and well-being. And in today's age, social health is even more important because we're not interacting with people as much. I, uh, I just met a friend of mine who said that her mother had her birthday. So at one of the clubs in Mumbai, she organized the party for her friends. There were 70 elderly women who showed up for that birthday party. And both of us were laughing that for us, maybe three people will show up. So that social health is so important, which was a part of our culture, very integrated society. And now with social media and busier lives, that is missing out. So please make time for your friends and family, even though it is challenging, but just like you would make time for exercise, make a little time for people because loneliness, I think the study said that is as bad as smoking 15 or 18 cigarettes a day. The impact on our heart, on our overall well-being, on our longevity is very strong. So we want to we want to put ourselves out there, put in the effort required. And lastly, spiritual health, because it's a very, very important component of yogic and Ayurvedic lifestyles, right? Not in terms of believing in God. Prayers and having a faith is very, very helpful. People with faith live longer. But also you need to have faith in yourself. Self-esteem, self-confidence are very, very important factors and define spiritual health. And again, with social media, a lot of our self-confidence, our, our levels of comparisons have increased. So those, those are creating an impact. And I want it just to be in your awareness. There's these two, social and spiritual health are also important. So if you cannot go to the gym tomorrow because you meet up with your friends, that's okay because you worked on your social health. And uh, that's it. Uh, I think there's, there won't be enough time for Q&A. So I will stop here very quickly. All I was saying was that these are five burners. There's a four burner theory, but I made it five burner theory that we cannot have all five aspects of life working, you know, at full fledged speed at all times. You will have to deprioritize at times. Maybe sometimes your physical health will take a back seat. Sometimes social health will take a back seat, but it's a cycle. Bring it back up whenever you can personalize your journey and accept that sometimes some things will not be optimal. Use your energies where it's most optimal. You are the best judge of that. With that, I will want to take up questions and uh, uh, you guys can always reach out to me. I've put my credentials there. Um, let me stop the share if you guys have noted down and let's look at questions now. I think I was disconnected for a bit. Okay. Namita, I felt like your presentation was speaking to me. Really? You know, whatever, whatever that you were saying here, sleeping well, I'm not doing that. Uh, yeah. Exercising, I'm not getting at all. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to ask a question here because I am working full-time. Even all of these learners here are in full-time jobs. And at, in the evenings after work, they are attending webinars. So they are DBA. They are all postgraduate students. So we uh -huh. are... Facilitate, facilitating these webinars. So I think all of us here are not getting time for exercise. So you, you were talking about resistant bands and exercise at home. Would you be able to uh, tell us yeah. how do we get started with exercise at home? Is, that any, is there any app we could follow or what should we do to get started? Yeah. Uh, very good question. And I think uh, uh, number one thing I'll say is there's something called micro workouts, which have been found very, very helpful, which is like uh, just five or two, three minutes of movement during the day helps. One of the best ways to do that is to take the stairs, is to walk the extra steps, is to park the car a little behind, is simply to fidget or to get up from your chair and sit back down. That's the starting point. Now, after that, to get in resistance bands, uh, typically, if you were to just join. There are a lot of people who offer online courses who will teach you how to do or who will make a program or get a coach to come for two, three days, then it is easier. 
yoga you can learn on your own sun salutations you can learn on your own but when it comes to strength training getting your form right is a little bit more important so that i would suggest work with someone for a brief period understand what the right form is and then you can go ahead on your own but anything which is body weight you can start on your own and yoga and sun salutations is a great place because just put a mat out even in a hotel room even in a small space you can do 12 rounds of sun salutations you will find a lot of information about it online my own youtube channel has a whole 7 8 series of uh, sun salutation breakdown but it's not difficult be intuitive don't worry people don't get injured very easily with sun salutations injuries happen in more advanced poses like headstand or arm balances etc sun salutations as long as you don't force yourself too much to you know bend forward or bend back will be just fine so i would recommend we start there and micro workouts any little movement just pacing around is good right okay thank you i have a few questions in the chat box so there's a question from sutappa uh, uh saying you mentioned fats so what kind of fats any examples uh fats uh, minimum are best but fats usually come to us from oils or some uh fruits or vegetables like avocado so you just want to make sure that they are uh, not uh, trans fats. that they you're not overusing uh, uh what do you call pre cooked oil and uh, saturated fats are not actually considered good which brings in a lot of our cultural foods as well but as of right now both for heart and diabetes and for insulin resistance saturated fats should be kept to a minimum rest uh, what i practice is keep changing your oils i don't use the same oil all the time so in a way i'm spreading the risk across various oils rather than sticking to one olive oil is considered one of the best as of right now across research studies mustard oil has also uh, been very highly appreciated so it's 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 uh, various research papers will come up with various uh, answers i would say just keep changing and saturated fats to a minimum thank you there's and another uh, question what time of the morning sunlight is advisable it depends on your skin color and where you are and what temp you know what weather it is so oh. in it, you know if you it is sunny earlier in the day you can go out earlier in the day if it's really hot you don't want to expose yourself for too long because there's a risk of skin cancer that comes with it best to check with the doctor in your area but for india let's say 8 9 or something depending on where you are again for a 15 10 to 15 minute exposure is uh, could be something you could consider but again even 2 minutes out in the sun just looking is good enough sorry i i answered it from a vitamin d perspective i forgot that was from a circadian rhythm perspective so uh, for sleep so the previous answer was more relevant for vitamin d i'm sorry for sleep you want to uh, uh, as soon as you wake up and it's sunny just step out the, uh, as early as you can when it's sunny when if if all sun is already risen by the time you're up no time factor but you've read somewhere that you shouldn't be out after 9 o'clock in the morning and so on is there that, such thing where that is for vitamin d because for vitamin d you need a longer exposure and for for sunlight you just go out there for a minute and come back that's that's fine and you can you you want your eyes to be exposed you you want your eyes to experience natural sunlight not through mm -hmm. a window yeah okay yeah. so there's also another question i think this question is good it represents what all of us are feeling here how can i ensure that i'm getting enough quality sleep despite the demands of my job again they are studying they're doing their phd their dba and mbas and so on and how they can get enough sleep 7 to 8 hours you mentioned yeah the one is the one is the quality of sleep second is it's your own experience do you feel refreshed one of the basic thing is do you feel refreshed do you feel energetic through the day or are you feeling uh, groggy and you feel like you've not get gotten enough sleep so that is one question second a hack which is an anecdotal hack it is not research based a lot of people who start okay. meditation start sleeping best so we will you know so mindfulness practices have some impact on sleep so it reduces your sleep even to an hour by a day so if you feel you're not getting enough sleep while it will not replace again not evidence or research anecdotal theory it will not replace lost sleep but practices like meditation yoga nidra body scan can help you recover to a greater degree so i would suggest you try that and see if that helps you feel better but there are a lot of apps also that measure quality of sleep now uh, a metric that's very helpful is called hrv which you which which you can research it maybe which helps you understand how well recovered you are after a good night's rest you need specific gadgets for it you measure it every morning at the same time okay uh yeah. thanks and there's another question on how can i distinguish between good and bad carbs 
uh, only one distinction is refined or not refined. So anything has been processed, then it's easier to digest. That becomes a bit more difficult. Second, if you're having them within limits, within your 55% limits, they're usually not bad. They become bad. Anything becomes bad when you overeat. So the dose makes the poison. Carbs itself are not bad. The fact that we overeating, overconsuming is bad. So good carbs is anything that's within 55%, but or approximately, that's, that's a very specific number, but approximately. And another thing is whole food your whole wheat or uh, millets, et cetera, which are whole grains are much better than refined grains, refined foods, white bread, white flour, et cetera. Again, in moderation doesn't mean you stop having them altogether. Okay. Um, okay, Sanjeev, I think you have a question that you want to ask? Yes, I want to ask. Yes, yeah. Sanjeev. Yes, okay. Those are fantastic insights. I mean, there's so much information all around. People get confused what is good, what is not good. So I think yeah. you put it beautifully saying how important it is to focus on all these aspects, not just one aspect like food or exercise, etc. Et Even sleep yeah. is important. I think I have been battling with one question of like, like uh, fit versus healthy, which is the recent debate. You know, like apparently very fit people suddenly falling ill or getting cardiac arrest and all. So I have been wondering what exactly is it? I mean, so, but I think you have answered it. I think if the answer is that they're not balancing it or probably they're not taking enough rest, etc. Et is that the reason? I mean, would you agree that that is the reason? Because I I've think... been wondering that apparently fit people, if it's happening to them, then what is the point of exercising, etc.? Yeah, so uh, what happens is the people who uh, have adverse events with exercise are actually very few compared to people who have adverse events because they don't exercise. So not exercising, let's say, brings out these many issues in people. Exercising is a very, but it becomes more popular in the media. So yes, if we look at Zerodha CEO's recent own self-analysis, right, when he went through his stroke, he said that I did not take enough rest. My father had just passed away. I was going through a lot of stress in my life. I should have taken some break, but I didn't. In Ayurveda, these are called crimes against wisdom or pragnya aparad. Aparad as in crime and pragnya as in wisdom. So yes, there is a point wherein all of us need to have the wisdom to know when to rest and recover. People, when they start exercising, enjoy it a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And that wisdom needs to come through as to create that overall balance in life. And I'm using Zerodha CEO's example because it was his own self-analysis and awareness that came through when he was revisiting what happened with him. That you. answer. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dalvin, we can take two more questions, one from Mr. Vijay and one from Mr. Rajiv Roshan, and then we can probably close. Yes, this. of course. Yeah, Vijay, you you want to ask a question? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Namita, for the wonderful session. Thanks, uh, Dalvin, and also Sanjeev for arranging this. Um, lots of uh, eye openings here. And also, I would say, hear openings. It's not just seeing, but also listening. Um, Namita, do you do you advocate having hot shower before the sleep? Um, there's some. There's a lot of things saying that you know, hot hot shower for sleep. For me, I felt that I'm not too sure whether it really helps there, but it just gives a good feeling. Yeah. That's one question. Second yes. question is uh, second question. Okay, um, are naps good? Forget about okay. how much nap, how much uh, time we nap. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, as as the military says, you know, frequent breaks are good. Yeah. Are really naps good? Because sometimes we think if if I take a nap, you know, people will laugh at me during mm -hmm. the office hours or whatever it is. But I just want to ask: Are naps good or bad? So um, these are these are the two important questions. The yeah. third question is: You said do what you want to do. Uh, that's true. We want to do, and that's how you know that gives us abundant of amount of energy. And if there is something that we do not want to do, uh, even if we are uh, given million dollars a minute, we still will not be able. To. Yeah. Okay. Last one. So I'm going fourth. The fourth one is. I think each time we move from one lifestyle to another or one type of activity to another, we carry on with the previous baggage and uh, then we get into stress. At least this is my observation. All these are from my observations. So, uh, let me just uh, repeat. Um, hot shower. Yeah. Perhaps good or bad. 
Yeah. Right. And three is uh, do what you want to do. And fourth one is moving from one lifestyle. Uh, on the moving from one lifestyle to another, what specifically is the question that how to do it or what are the challenges with it? Oh. Um, I think we get carried away from the previous baggage and uh, hence we are unable to adjust to the new lifestyles and that's what creates the problem. Yeah. Got it. So thank you. Thank you for your appreciation, uh, Mr. Vijay. And on hot showers, it is uh, it is currently recommended, I think, uh, from Mr. Huberman to everyone is recommending warm showers at night because it helps you sleep. So yes, there is research behind it that a cold shower in the morning and a warm shower in the evening is actually helpful because it impacts your body temperature in a way that it helps you sleep better. So definitely something you can consider. I also believe personalization is important. If something works for... 50 people, it may not work for the remaining other 50 people. So always try. And if it works, we, we can give it a try. There is no harm. Hot, I don't know, but warm shower, definitely. Are naps good or bad? It, two things here. Naps actually are very good. Incidentally, if you have heard of the blue zones, the blue zones are the places where people have the longest life, longest and healthiest life, which means they don't get diseases till like 1995. And one of the blue zones, I think Sardinia, I'm missing, but one of the blue zones, people are nappers. They nap a lot. So it actually helps them. Second, napping is a very effective strategy to manage jet lag. It is actually specific 20 minute naps. You have coffee right before that nap. It helps you recover from jet lag as well. Only thing is napping after 4 p.m. can interfere with your uh, with your nighttime sleep and very long naps also interfere with, uh, uh, with your sleep. So 20 minute naps are actually quite useful for various purposes and in at least one country or area are linked to uh, a long and healthy life as well. Again, personalization doesn't mean we force ourselves to start napping, but if we naturally have a desire to nap, I think we should explore and honor it. And do what you love. I will tie into the concept of uh, dharma or dharma in Indian uh, philosophy, right? Which is basically your purpose to be. Why did you come into this world? What am I most relevant for? Or let's say the discussion between Krishna and Arjun in the Gita, wherein uh, Arjun's core purpose of dharma was to be the warrior and when you do what you are most aligned to you are far more successful but there are times in my in our lives when we get deviated from that and uh, so i like to use that theory that playing to your strengths is how you best fulfill your potential in this world so that is why i believe in doing what you love either in your profession or outside your profession it is your purpose to be it is what makes you feel most relevant and when we play to our strength is when we find happiness, is when we find uh, satisfaction as well. Rather than doing things which we are not aligned with, it takes a lot of energy out of us. So that was one. And um, I hope that answers. The third is uh, change of lifestyle. And in all my journey of health and wellness over all these years, I'll tell you the biggest challenge is not lack of information, is not lack of knowledge, it is behavior change. And even science doesn't understand why people change their behavior. In fact, US has created this thing called Center for Behavior Change. And a whole lot of research is going on to understand why certain things work. Why do people change their behavior so they can make a scalable model out of it? Um, so behavior change is tricky. It happens, but why it happens, we don't know. So you have to try different things. One of the very popular books and effective ones is Atomic Habits, which gives a lot of insight on how to layer your behavior and get it to change. Fair, fair bit of models also out there, but I'll come back to your next session, which is mindfulness. One of the best ways to sustainably change behavior and change the way our brain is wired is through mindfulness practices. So while there's a lot of information, if I had to pick one, I would say find a mindfulness practice to help with behavior change because it is challenging. It is the only challenge, not knowledge, not information, the change. I hope it answered for you, Mr. Vijay. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Namita, uh, very much, very much. You gave a lot of information, and everything is very useful. Thank um, you. Coming, coming to the what you want to do. Ninety-nine percent of the time, we do not get that opportunity, or we do not get that chance. I wish I could do so many things, lie down on the beach, and then do so many things, but I don't. So we have to deal with a whole lot of things which we really don't like or not in our life, and that's where I think is the challenge, and that's where. Uh, the question of adjustability and all the things that you talked about, mindfulness comes into picture. And that practice has to be uh, put in place. That's yes. what. 
Yes, uh, I think non-attachment then comes into play there. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that that's absolutely okay. important. All right. I'm afraid uh, we have to stop the Q&A segment here. I know there are so many other interesting questions that all of you want to ask Namita. But Namita, I hope you'd be okay to uh, interact with them via emails or anything, if that's okay with you. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, because we have, a, we have another speaker. So thank you, Namita, for your wonderful sharing on ways to pave the way for a happier life. And also, I, I like what you just said, uh, Adarna Dharam. So in a more fulfilling existence as well. I think it's very true. We should do what we love. In, in fact, work where we, what we are happy. Okay, do, uh, choose a study topic where, which we are happy with. This is what we always tell our students as well. Do what you love because when you do what you love, you'll have a very good end result. So thank you so much, Namita. Your dedication to promoting well-being is truly, truly inspiring. And I'm grateful for all the knowledge that you've imparted with us today. Thank you so very now, much. I'd like to introduce, thank you. I'd like to introduce our second speaker for today's session, Mr. Sandeep Nath, who will be sharing on using mindfulness for competitive advantage. So Sandeep Nath is the founder of the Renewalism Movement and IIT IIM alumnus. He founded and ran a successful strategy consulting company before heading to the Himalayas in search of the purpose of life and what drives our energetic consciousness. So as a professional speaker and inner power coach, he has taken angel oriental wisdom practices to more than 46 countries across four continents. And author of four books, Business Qigong Guide, Mindfulness Facilitator, and Top 10 Mental Health Expert, Sandeep specializes in overcoming complex business challenges by empowering individual energies. His mission in the current decade is to raise human consciousness. So, Mr. Sandeep, my first question for you. How did your Himalayan, Himalayan journey reshape your approach to entrepreneurship and mindfulness? We are, we are still talking on mindfulness here, but I believe you have a different take on mindfulness given Thank your you, journey Mr. in the Mr. Himalayas. Yes. Uh, in fact, you know, it's so nice what Navita has said. It completely corroborates with anything that I'm going to say. So hopefully we can continue the Q&A session and I will attempt to start with uh, one of the questions about mindfulness, about, you know, methods and tools, which is what I learned in the Himalayas. When, when uh, we, we look at the way that I'm going to be talking to you, uh, I'm going to be bringing in concepts from Taoism and uh, Zen and of course Vedic wisdom which we have known, they tried and tested for 2,500 years and more. But we just forgot to incorporate them in the current business and lifestyle. And now science is trying to catch up to validate what Ayurveda has already been saying, what traditional Chinese medicine has already been saying. So to understand why, for example, a hot uh, shower is good, it's important to relax the body before going to sleep. And then sleep in a cool environment, like Namita said. Now, this is because it balances the yin and yang energy. Some of you may have seen this uh, yin and yang symbol, you know, which is how your uh, male energy and your female energy stay in balance. If they go out of balance, you get stressed. So whenever your energy is going down, your stress is going up. Always remember this. This is fundamentally important. Why? Because often as corporate okay, executives... Right. Yes we tend to do things with a lot of passion, with a lot of energy, with a lot of aggressiveness. Remember that when you're using that aggressiveness, it is your yang energy that is leaving you. Whereas when you're sleeping or when you are compassionate or when you're kind or when you're listening or when you're taking in, your yin energy is powering you. So to rebalance yourself, sleeping is very important. And it's very important that you rebalance with this combination of yin and yang. Always you're aware of it. So that's one of the things that the Himalayan thing taught me. You know, It also taught me how to keep generating energy, how to keep sustaining your energy high so that you can be always having stress low. Remember, this is on a seesaw. So we can talk more about energy habits and stuff like that because that really brings stress down. So that, that's uh, as far as the starting goes, Dr. Kudar. Okay. So, Sunny, from your journey, 
in the Himalayas and uh, across the four continents, I think more than 46 countries you mentioned, right? So what key principles have you found most effective in maintaining a mindful approach during high pressure situations and while dealing with demanding clients? Because I think a lot of these learners here are working in corporate uh, sectors and they're also doing DBA and MBAs and so on. So Correct, correct. Great question. So I come from that space myself. I used to run a consulting company and I was very highly stressed. In fact, I'll give you uh, an anecdotal uh, reference of my own that when I started discovering energy, uh, I, I learned the practice of Reiki. Now Reiki is how you channel universal energy to uh, fuel yourself and to heal others also. Reiki requires practice. Like 21 days after you get initiated, you have to practice for at least 45 minutes every day. I never had the time. Never. I mean, it was out of the question. I did it because it was fashionable. My friends were doing it. So same goes for exercise, I believe. So, sorry? Same goes for exercise, I believe. Same goes for exercise. Exactly. In fact, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I'll come back to that. So finishing with this Reiki thing, what I decided was, that since I have done the program, I might as well practice in the night because I'm a night animal. I'm not a day person. I'm not a morning person. Uh, I usually was going to sleep around 12.30, 1. So I said, okay, let me start this practice at 12.30, finish by 1.15 and then go to sleep. Kid you not, guys. The first day I did this, at 1.15, I was so refreshed that I went on working. I was a workaholic until 2 in the night. Second day, same thing happened. I said, my God, this is a very profitable business. I invest 45 minutes here. I get an hour and a half out of it. That's how energy works. Because I was also waking up fresh at 8 in the morning, which was my usual time. I was getting more time out of the day. And how this relates with uh, exercise is exercise is what we do at the body level. Now you must know we are composed at three levels. The body, the mind, and the spirit. Spirit is energy. Now, when we go to the gym, we get energy. But we've got to do a lot of 300 reps and all that, you know, push-ups and all that sort of stuff. Maybe uh, half an hour or whatever. But like Namita said, if you do yoga, which is the joining of body and mind, the yoga, you get the mind involved, you don't have to do so many reps. 12 Surya Namaskars is good enough. It will give you that level of fitness. When you work with energy, which is Qigong, as you mentioned in my introduction, which is bringing the energy, this mind and the body together, you work very soft and very few repetitions, but very powerful. So that's what was a game changer in my ability to handle stress. And uh, thereafter, I mean, uh, for the last 15, 17 years, I have been in a position where I can just eliminate stress. And two things that happened because of that, you asked me about the, the experiences I've had globally. Two things that, ha that ha help with that is, one is acceptance. You, you, you got to understand that whatever situation you're faced with, you can either counter it, you can not, uh, you know, you can fight it, you can not accept it, or you can accept and find a way around it. If you don't accept it, what's happening is your yang energy is going. You are exhausting yourself. Whereas the moment you're accepting it, it's becoming voluntary and you're building your capacity to handle it. So you make yourself bigger than the situation. The situation stops stressing you. This happens a lot at airports. This happens a lot with, uh, uh, you know, when your hotel booking goes wrong, when people don't turn up, when commitments are not kept, all that. First thing, pause and accept. The second thing is I noticed that my, my business globally became a lot smoother because of authenticity. So I'm giving you two A's. One is acceptance of everything. And the second is authenticity, which is being, being the same wherever you are. So uh, I remember we, we, uh, my wife and I, we, were, uh, we had embraced Tibetan Buddhism uh, when, when we... When we got into these energy practices. And uh, there, was, there was this foreign couple from Spain who had come over and uh, we were just helping them out. We took them to places that we knew of and uh, it was their first trip. And we made good friends. 
Some six months later, we were uh, planning a trip to Spain and they invited us. And uh, we thought we'll have a cup of tea with them and all that. They said, no, no, you keep a week for us. We'll take you to Portugal. So I said, wow, <laughs> that, was, that was a free holiday for us, you know. And uh, they took us there. What we didn't know at that time, guys, is that they were checking us out more deeply. And when we came back to Madrid, they said, uh, Sandeep, we'd like you to do a program for us. In about four days' time, they invited about 15 of their uh, close circle to do an uh, energy empowerment workshop, which was the first workshop we did overseas. And after that, there have been many. And that set the momentum for a completely different life where we were manifesting these workshops all over the world. Now, what I'm telling you this for is, had we been something else to them in Portugal or in India when we met them first, this extra workshop and this completely different way of running a global business would not have been. So always, when we talk about mindfulness, we talk about remembering what is your element and staying in that element, staying true to yourself. That, that, that overcomes a lot of challenges that you could potentially have. So you mentioned acceptance and authenticity. That works wonders, really, wherever in the world you might be. Okay. So Sandeep, just want to know, how did this experience that, these experiences that you've had has shaped your understanding of human consciousness across cultures? And what's the impact on entrepreneurship and also mindfulness? Yeah. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. Many of, How many of you are entrepreneurs? Can you just give me a show of hands uh, if you run your own businesses or your solopreneurs? Or uh, is everybody an employee? Uh, because I'll give the answer accordingly. So I don't see any entrepreneurs here. So, so you know, when you are working for a, a task, you, you are uh, a part of a team, then what's very important in applying mindfulness is getting your team to be aware with you of what is it that's going on. That will give you synergies in the team. How do you do that? Let's uh, take Rajiv's question. How do you build a mindful habit? How do you use that for uh, building better team relationships? How, uh, how do you know that you, you're on strategy? What I recommend is that you set an alarm in your phone. Everybody's got this phone, right? Set an alarm for every hour. And every hour that the uh, alarm goes off, whether you're in a meeting or you're by yourself or you're with another team member, take a pause and explain to them, we're taking a one minute break. In that one minute break, do three of those long breaths that Namita talked about. Because when you do the long breathing, what's happening is you're exhaling more. When you're exhaling more, there is more yang energy coming out. There's more male energy coming out. That's what helps us work. And you get clarity of mind and you work better. You do 30 seconds of that, three breaths. Get up, both of you or all of you. Take a little walk to the fridge or the water cooler or wherever you get water from. Rehydrate yourself. Drink this up. Every, every 10 minutes, have a sip so that you finish a glass every hour. Stay hydrated. And while you're walking to the cooler, just twist around. You know what he was saying about micro exercise? Do that. Bend, stretch, twist, kick. So that you are giving a pattern interrupt to the body. You're also giving a pattern interrupt to the overthinking mind. Because what will happen is every hour, if you take a one minute break and do these three things, you will get 10 minutes of extra productivity because of that one minute investing. Remember my energy example? It's the same logic. So make this a habit. You will find that whether it's 10 a.m. in the morning or 10 a.m. in the night, you will be replenished with energy. You will always have it. And that becomes a habit. Then you uh, start creating a culture of more effectiveness and uh, better productivity with all your team members. Everybody starts feeling healthier, starts feeling mentally more active and agile, starts feeling more uh, alive because, you know, you've been sitting for an hour. Just do this with me, okay? Just do this together. Ah! We just stretch out like that. Ah! And then with the YouTube. 
if you can just stretch that way, you'll notice you've oxygenated yourself more, deliberately, mindfully, with full awareness of what you're doing. Your body will thank you for the extra oxygen. Your mind will thank you for the pattern interrupt. And your spirit will feel calmer and you'll be more peaceful. You'll get more yin energy coming in to fuel you as you go on with your day. So do these things. I think uh, I'd love to hear from you. Another thing is, if uh, you guys like, you guys could take a stress test. I'll just put up a QR code. And you can click it. आपके पीछे so it's uh, the link is something you could click keep it open and after we finish with this <laughs> see what the results tell you it's customized aap count karna shuru kar diye kya i'm so sorry i'm so sorry uh, sandeep i just have to mute this yeah. dananjay 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 66 days mein bhi ja sakta hai धनंजय Ushan is the admin. I'm just asking him. To. Anyhow, over to you, uh, Dr. Alvinder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, Sandeep. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Very interesting concepts you're sharing, advice on mindfulness and so on. But this, this interesting concept you're talking about, Qigong, and you have also written this in your guide on business Qigong. So I... Uh, are we able to hear or uh, is it only me? I'm, I'm not able to hear you. No, we lost uh, Professor Dalvin. So we'll just wait for her to reconnect. Hello. Yeah, you're back. Yes. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Am I audible? I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, very interesting uh, advice you have shared on how to incorporate mindfulness in daily routines. You mentioned breathing exercises that Namita initially mentioned as well, having uh, sipping water, micro exercises and so on. But this very interesting concept you're talking about Qigong. So I'm just um, keen to know on how do ancient oriental wisdom practices influence modern businesses? Also, like you've mentioned in your guide on business Qigong as well. Would you be able to share more on that, Sandeep? Yes, certainly. So let's look at modern businesses and modern life. Why are we stressed? Stress arises because of simple understanding that things are out of alignment. It's like in your car, if, you, if you're a manual uh, gear shift driver, if your accelerator and your clutch and your gear are misaligned, you get a sound. Let's say you release the clutch, but uh, you're pressing the accelerator too much. There's a grrr sound, right? That's the sound of a stressed engine. Now, likewise, this, that, remember that sound of stress. When we, our body, our mind, and our spirit are out of alignment, we are stressed. Now, how do we know that we are stressed? How do we know that our body is out of alignment with our mind, let's say? The mind manifests in what you say. You have a lot of thoughts, but what you say is what are processed by the mind. The body does stuff, right? So what you do is done by the body. Now, if you're saying something and doing something else, it's a recipe for stress. If you're feeling something different, which is where the spirit comes in, 
and you're saying something different from what you really feel, again, yes. So bringing your body, mind, and spirit, your say, do, and be in harmony, the say, do, be harmony, what we call in that book, you can be out of stress. Now, bringing that into Qigong. Qigong is a practice that integrates the body, mind, and spirit as a habit. What we just did, this could be classified as a Qigong habit because we have moved the body. We breathe in at that time, so our mind goes with our breath and we are releasing the energy. Energy, typically, we, uh, we visualize and that's how we use it, we direct it. But this is a very small Qigong practice where, as a habit, we are synchronizing body, mind, and spirit. Likewise, when we're doing the, the long breaths, uh, you're breathing out the yang energy, you're getting more energy, and the mind is having a pattern interrupt, you're taking that break, right? So the body, mind, and spirit are all three involved in your habit forming. When you're involved in habit forming, you will, through course of habit, keep reducing stress, as simple as that. Coming to organizations, just before I uh, let you back on this topic, uh, Dr. Lavender. In an organization, your team, the people, are the body of an organization. The processes which you have laid down to work most efficiently are the mind of the organization. And the purpose, why do we exist, is the driving spirit of the organization. So when we align people, purpose, and process, we are reducing organizational stress. When we are able to align everybody's own purpose with the organizational purpose, we are creating stress-free organization across the layers of the organization. So those are the kind of areas that I consult in. We happy to have a chat with you one-on-one -on -one about that. But the principles come from reducing stress through body, mind, spirit alignment. And Chikang is a great habit at an individual level to do that, also at a team level to unify the energies of the team. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I'm just uh, wrapping this up by, so Qigong is basically a way to optimize energy and create unity between our mind, body, and spirit. Absolutely. Am I? On all three levels, right? as a habit. So it always okay. stays with you. So it's just the same, like you say, a tie, with, like yoga is a tie between mind and body, the yoga. So it's the same here as well. Qigong is more to an oriental wisdom, right? Correct. Which also involves the energy layer and therefore the exercises are very subtle and much more powerful. Okay. So Sandeep, one last question before we take the questions from our participants here. So in a competitive market, how can our learners here uh, leverage mindfulness not just as a personal practice but as a strategic tool to stay ahead in whatever they're doing so um, mindfulness I'd like you to remember it with the with the uh, way that Rajni Khan talks about it you know he says mind it right now what does he mean when he says mind it he means remember I am Rajni Khan don't mess with me right or when sometimes we see this uh, board on top, it says, mind your head. What does that mean? It means be, remember that you have a head so you don't hit yourself. So the word mindfulness, by root, it comes from that mind of remembering. When we remember what it is that we are doing and why it is that we are doing it at any point in time, we do it a lot more effectively. This maps pretty much with what Navita had said, you know, pay attention to what you, you choose to pay attention to what you're doing because you choose to remember that this is what I'm doing. And in, in doing that, there is one thing that gives you huge advantage and that is you bring yourself into the frame. If we live mindlessly, anything goes. You know, we eat mindlessly, anything goes. We sleep mindlessly, at least we're getting some sleep, it doesn't matter. What is happening is that we are drawing ourselves to the side. When we are aware of ourselves mindfully, then everything that you've got by way of the driving force that you have for your organization and your team 
starts getting focused and starts getting used a lot more powerful. You are the competitive advantage for your life. You are what differentiates you authentically from everybody else. Let people know that. And they will know that when they start seeing you, remembering who you are as you are. So on that note, I wish you bring out your authentic selves. Be aware of what is it that you are doing right now for what purpose and do that in, 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 a, in a way that is uniquely you. And you will see everybody taking notice that you're so different and so powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, uh, Sandeep. I like your take on mindfulness and how you're introducing all these concepts. I think, yeah, it's very important, especially in such fast-pacing world, we normally lose ourselves and lose so much of authenticity. And we... we uh, often you know put ourselves in a very difficult position so thank you thank you so much i will now open this session for question and answers you have already addressed one very important question rajiv had on some advisors on mindfulness so if anyone else has any questions for uh mrs sandeep please do ask you can raise your hand or yeah, yeah I... yes vijay prasad vijay prasad you may ask yeah uh, let me uh, thank and uh, congratulate also Sandeep uh, for this uh, once again uh, yet another wonderful session. Thank you. As I have been listening to you, um, just a thought occurred that the commonality between uh, what you said and what uh, Namita has said one thing that comes up as a common thing is the, I would say, mindfulness. I mean, so the center point is the mindfulness. Um, I would like to correct me and I would like to listen to your thoughts. I would say the mindfulness to me is more like a, a simple thing. I am a very a slow person to understand. So it is like presence of mind. Um, so, so if I have full control of my mind, uh, that is, uh, so when I say mind, please, it's not just mind, my, my mind, my body, my emotion. Let me put it that way. Um, body means again, when what body does, what mind says. So, so let me put it. So if we have these three under control, then any situation, we will not have a major response. At least we'll think a little bit and then then at least apply. And in order to do that, and again, I would say that what are the prerequisites are then mind control, physical body control, emotional control, and what are the prerequisites for those three things would be what uh, you and Dr. Namita said, is it physical activity, uh, the diet portion, the, the diet component, the sleep, and then social and spiritual. You also talked about spiritual. You also, so if these four things, so it's like a pyramid. And the right at the top is presence of mind. The next level is the three things. Your control over mind, control over body, control over your emotion. And the lowest level, that is where all the things come up and what it feels in physical activity, your diet, and then your sleep, and your social and spiritual. There is mindfulness, but I removed that because I put it at the apex. Right. Your, your comments. Very interesting observations. First of all, I must thank all of you. I see it's already 12.45 and so many of you are still here. I really appreciate that. Uh, Vijay, your points are very uh, correct and that only goes to show how uh, science is finally catching up with ancient wisdom and we are converging on the same ideas. What's especially important is to understand the nature of this pyramid that you point to. You know, 2,500 years ago, the body the mind and the spirit were given equal importance. Today, it's become not, not, not just a pyramid, it's become like a spire where we hardly know anything about our energy or spirit. We know a little about our mind. We know a lot about our body. In fact, if you ask the person in the street, what is uh, health about? He would say it's diet and exercise because that's only about the body. But there are so many other factors related to uh, mental wellness, emotional wellness, spiritual wellness, uh, environmental wellness, 
and then moving further up into how energy can be the reason why the the the, the performance of an individual can go so much higher 2500 years ago when buddha was teaching nobody wrote anything for 4500 years it was all oral transmissions and when they finally wrote after 4500 years they wrote 84000 sutras now 84000 sutras were just being memorized by people like you and me because we were so connected with the energy of that transmission Today you can't remember eighty-four lines. Uh, at least I can't. I don't know about you. <laughs> so the the capacity has gone so much down because of our connection with that bottom of the pyramid, the body part. That even the mind is we hardly able to analyze our emotions and our mood swings and all that, and we're totally disconnected with energy, which is spirit. So if you connect with energy, you become spiritual. so it's physical mental and spiritual that's that's all there is to spirituality your connection with energy in pure form that's my comment on it thank Answer. you thank so you. much thanks uh, thanks uh, adeep it's uh, you you explained it well thanks for bringing out the, the spiritual component which i which is uh, missing and uh, i'm very happy that you pointed out that will stick in my mind forever thanks Okay. Sunny, I know this is a bit over the time already, but yeah. uh, would would you mind taking one last question from Rajiv? Rajiv has a question. Absolutely, love your participation, guys. Thank you so much. Rajiv, uh, over to you. Uh, yes, I am audible now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thanks, uh, Mr. Sandeep, for your filtered and experience for bringing people, process. and driving purposes in the corporate parallels and we, which was a very learning for those audience like me who is practicing mindfulness uh, oh, only oh. i think the time is running out so i will be asking you only simple questions you use the word staying true to yourself how is it or difficult any mantra to participate it to perfection lovely question <laughs> I, i think it's lovely because i do have a mantra also <laughs> so you know uh, rajiv the the visualize a parrot on your shoulder okay now this parrot is a talking parrot and this parrot knows only one line and that line is is that what you want if you answer to that parrot whenever you you know like I, i'm going to i'm going to have uh, a, a sip of water the parrot asks is that what you want my answer is yes i go ahead have it what happens what i do what i say and what i feel stay aligned i feel i must have that water i do it and i say i'm going to have the water if the same thing with alcohol and because rajiv uh, and i are social drinkers and rajiv is sitting in front of me and i say ki yaar let let's uh, let's have a drink i i don't drink okay i don't have whiskey generally but i've got to keep my pretenses high with rajiv the same thing the parrot asks is that what you want i deep inside i know i don't it's only because i want to look good in front of rajiv i'm going to start stressing myself my sedu b goes out of alignment so your mantra is is that what you want and if the answer is yes go ahead do it otherwise or say it or don't say it don't do it appreciate uh, the, the sandeep and uh, as you have uh, uh, and consultant uh, for uh, these things i was the, the last question was is there any uh, assessment tools for Uh, so so much of practices of mindfulness in the corporate sector well the uh, assessment tools are not for mindfulness per se but for the fallout of mindfulness which lies in eight dimensions of wellness and uh, uh, the, these dimensions of wellness all get positively impacted whether uh, it is a physical mental spiritual emotional social um, environmental financial occupational um all all of them because they get positively impacted because we adopt the habits of mindfulness 
And this this is a completely uh, different subject. I encourage you to just go over to sandeepnath.com and on the top right corner, you've got a WhatsApp button. Click that and let's be in touch and uh, I could share the templates with you and we'll have a conversation. Appreciate Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. And, and thanks, uh, Dr. Dalvinder and Sanjeev for uh, giving us the opportunity to listening to these two very, very four um, um, uh, uh, speakers. And we have enjoyed the, uh, this Saturday first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Very simple mantra, but impactful. So thank you for sharing your invaluable insights and leveraging mindfulness for competitive ad advantage and also for our personal advantage. Your expertise, your expensive experience have shed light on the profound impact of mindful mindfulness practices in enhancing our performance professionally and also achieving success in whatever we are doing, in whatever environment we are in. So thank you to the coordinators, uh, Mr. Sanjeev and Mr. Pushan. Thank you to the speakers today, Namita and Sandeep. We greatly appreciate your contribution to our webinar and we look forward to implementing these strategies for both our personal and professional growth. And yeah, together, I hope, you know, with all this sharing that you've inspired us, your, your wisdom, your sharing has really, really inspired us today. So thank you so much. Over to, the, to you, Sanjeev. If you have anything to say. No, I have nothing to say except thank you for being an excellent moderator. And mm. thanks a lot to Sandeep and Namita for such wonderful insights. It was really, really beautiful to listen every word of what both of you had to say. And also to listen to Dalvinder, the way she conducted the whole thing. Thanks a lot from the bottom of my heart. Sandeep, one last note. Uh, do you have any uh, LinkedIn or anything you would like to share with the participants here? Your page or link to your page? Sandeepnath.com. On the top right corner, you've got access to LinkedIn and WhatsApp and YouTube everywhere. Sandeepnath.com, right? Okay. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Be in touch. And bye. Thank you, Namita. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Dalvinder, Sanjeev, and Pushan. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All, all, four, all five of you have done a great job, great learnings today. We hope to we hope to hear more from you once again. So, Dalvinder, the Namita and uh, and Sandeep uh, will be with us, right? They will be constantly coming like this, and uh, we'll be we will be talking to us. So, don't want to say. Don't want to say thank you too much. Uh, so I like you want to, to say, see them I, again? I, I like to take it back. Uh, so, <laughs> so you want to say see you again then? Say, yeah, yeah, again and again and again. That's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. We we need this kind of inspiring sessions every yeah. now and then to wake us up. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm 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 woken up today uh, with all this sharing, and I hope to also practice this in my own life as well. Thank you again, and goodbye, everyone.